Hi, this is Jeff Klein, editor of Rita Graphics, and today I am pleased to have with us Drs. Harit Kapoor and Mariana Zagoraskaya, who are from the Department of Radiology at the University of Kentucky Chandler Medical Center, authors of one of our featured papers in the current November 2020 issue of Radiographics. Their article is entitled, Minimal Aortic Injury, Mechanisms, Imaging Manifestations, Natural History, and Management. Drs. Kapoor and Zagoraskaya, welcome to one of our November 2020 Radiographics podcasts. Thank you for invitation. Thank you, Dr. Klein. So, Harit, let me begin with you. Let's begin by discussing the concept of minimal aortic injury and its distinction from significant aortic injury in patients who sustain blunt thoracic aortic injury. We'll put up figure one for our viewers from the article as you take us through the different morphologic forms of traumatic aortic injury. Sure. Um, and uh, thank you very much. Um, we are really humbled to share our um, what we have learned about this topic with all the listeners. And I would like to thank all of our um, co-authors for their contribution. So the concept of MAI is very closely linked to the management. It's essentially the concept of generating a probably benign category to prize these polytrauma patients who have multiple injuries that need attention. So prior to 1990s, uh, every evidence of aortic injury meant angiography exploration and repair. So when with newer multi-detector CTs, when we started seeing the aorta in submillimeter and multi-planar detail, we started recognizing these small aortic injuries, which we didn't know much to do about. So different experts had different thresholds for repair and different definitions of MEI. Uh, it was still hard for, for surgeons to let go of the aortic injury and let the patient walk out of the hospital with it. So this was until 2011 when the Society of Vascular Surgery endorsed a basic classification system separating the injury grades by the depth of aortic wall involved. So this figure captures the various morphologic stages of blunt aortic injury at the most common site, the isthmus. The top row describes the minimal injury forms which are confined to the intima or may involve the media partially and usually affect less than one centimeter of the vessel length. These from left to right are the small intimal flap, as you can see, large intimal flap, small flap with thrombus or voladeren thrombus and intramural hematoma. So here the external contour is maintained, which is a reassuring evidence that the involved segment is continuing to withstand the systemic blood pressure. So these injuries are managed medically. The bottom row shows the significant aortic injury forms, which are intramural hematoma where the contour is altered, pseudoaneurysms and rupture. So here, the alteration in the aortic contour is a radiologic manifestation that the um, depth of injury is high and there is higher chance of progressing to rupture along the outer tensile contour of the aorta. So these patients require emergent or urgent intervention. So while right now the radiologic classification is very straightforward, uh, straightforward, the MAI is when there is no contour involvement and SAI when there is, uh, but ongoing multi-center studies, registries looking into non-operative management may possibly expand this category of MAI to include some of the SAI categories. Over to you, Dr. Klein. Thank you so much, Dr. Kapoor. So I want to move on to figure two, which I think nicely illustrates the four primary injury mechanisms that may result in traumatic aortic injury. Can you take us through these as we show this figure to our audience? Absolutely. So this illustration demonstrates the four main forces that lead to the aortic injury, which are stretch, shear, pinch, and thump in the clockwise fashion. So let's consider the most common scenario where an MAI would be seen. And that would be a restrained motor vehicle driver involved in a frontal collision. So here the tug on the aorta is quick, but somewhat controlled because of the seat belt and airbags. When the body takes the sudden jerk, the largest forces are the craniocaudal stretch uh, because of the restraints and the quick shear or tug at the point of aortic wall fixation, such as the isthmus. Isthmus, as you can see, forms the point of convergence of all these forces. The other two forces, uh, which are the bottom two, uh, have a smaller contribution to the initiation of the injury, but greater effect on injury progression. These are the forces of mechanical pinching of the aorta, 
where the sternum and spine, uh, between the sternum and spine and the intraluminal pressurization or the water hammer effect due to the rapid compression and decompression of the chest. On the other hand, a significant aortic injury would be occurring with a more impactful trauma in a less controlled fashion, such as with a passenger without a seat belt or with side collisions. Terrific. Well, thank you for that. Uh, I just want to show for our audience figure three in the article, which we'll put up, uh, which I think nicely provides a breakdown of the uh, incidence of minimal aortic injury by location along the course of the thoracic aorta with various imaging examples. Now, Dr. Zergoroskaya, I want to move to you. Um, so moving to the imaging findings of minimal aortic injury, these are divided into direct uh, or indirect signs. The two most common imaging findings of an intimal tear are a rounded or triangular intraluminal filling defect or a thin focal intimal flap. You also describe an intramural hematoma as a finding in the trauma setting, which is important to distinguish from a spontaneous intramural hematoma in a patient who presents with a non-traumatic acute aortic syndrome. Let's take a look at figure four in the article and have you take us through the findings as illustrated in these particular cases. Absolutely, Dr. Klein. Um, the direct signs we mean visualizing the changes involving the aorta itself. And as you correctly stated, uh, these most commonly involve uh, on multi-detector CTA, the intima of the aorta presenting with a rounded or triangular small intraluminal defect without external contour abnormality. Those findings are seen in about 85% of the cases uh, or thin linear intimal flap, which is seen in about 15% of the cases. Both of these findings usually measure no more than one centimeter and most frequently occur at the level of the aortic isthmus, which is similar to the significant aortic injury. As can be seen on images A through D, these findings can be uh, solitary or could be multifocal or sometimes they can be even associated with the significant aortic injury. Uh, additional or but least common imaging presentation of minimal aortic injury includes indeed this intramural hematoma. When it classifies within the MRI category, it usually measures less than one centimeter in thickness. And this specific imaging entity comprises less than 5% of the all MRI cases. In addition to the direct signs, uh, we can observe the indirect signs of the minimal aortic injury. These are represented by the periaortic and mediastinal hemorrhage, similar to the significant aortic injury. And it's interesting that in the past, these specific types of hemorrhage were used to exclude the minimal aortic injury. But as technology has evolved, we start to see more and more of these hemorrhages. And it turned out that now they presented about two thirds percent of the minimal aortic injury cases and therefore no longer served as exclusion criteria. Terrific. So Mariana, you next discuss indirect signs of aortic injuries such as periaortic or mediastinal hematoma, uh, which are more common in significant aortic injury, uh, but can be seen in MAI. Uh, next in the article is a review of the technical and anatomic mimics of MAI, and you show several examples of this. Can we look at figure nine, which I think is the artifact that we most commonly encounter, which is due to cardiac motion. Can you show us this case and discuss how to mitigate this particular artifact? Sure, Dr. Klein. Uh, you're right. The most frequently encountered technical artifact that we see during the aortic evaluation on multi-detector CTA is indeed a pseudo-abnormality of the proximal ascending thoracic aorta related to cardiac motion. It is also called a pulsation artifact. This specific artifact is observed on over the 90% of the multi-detector CTA non-gated studies and presents as a faulty decrease in peripheral aortic density and or multiple or small linear uh, line that can be mistaken for an intimal flap or flaps. And these are usually involve the left anterior or the right posterior aortic circumferences. And the hint to their artifactual nature is just the fact that the similar findings are frequently seen on the same slice to involve the pulmonary arterial or pulmonary venous structures. And moreover, these pseudo-abnormalities have a tendency to extend beyond the aortic contours into the mediastinal fat. 
and multi-planary formatted images are usually quite helpful in confirming these pseudo findings as rather artifacts than the true pathology. If none of these maneuvers are quite convincing to an observer, then repeating the exam with the cardiac gating as demonstrated on the provided right image helps to resolve this issue. Cardiac gating can be done as a prospective or retrospective, but most of the places prefer to utilize rather retros retrospective type of the gating since it allows reconstruction and selection of the best image free of any artifacts during the any or the best cardiac cycle. That's a very important point. Thank you for that. So Dr. Kapoor, uh, can you briefly review the natural history of MAI as detailed in the article? We'll go ahead and show figure 10, which is I think a typical example of the CT follow-up of these particular injuries. Sure, uh, let's go through the images. Um, these images belong to a 55-year-old victim of an unrestrained car crash who had stable hemodynamic parameters and came through our ED, underwent a CTA. The subparts A and B show two intimal thrombi uh, along the anterior wall of the aorta, just inferior to the isthmus. The patient was put on pharmacological blood pressure control to allow for intimal healing, and the injury did show resolution at four weeks, which you can see in subparts C and D. So this is the most common outcome of a minimal aortic injury. Since minimal aortic injury is the mildest form of aortic injury with limited intermedial disruption, they heal and endotheliize faster than other aortic injuries. They are treated with strict uh, systemic blood pressure control and antiplatelet regimen which allows by one to two months a healing of the prothrombotic intimal breach uh, and the clinicians can stop the pharmacologic management. So 85% of these injuries usually resolve and an additional 10% stabilize, leaving about 5% which are shown to progress and require semi-elective repair. It is these 5% that we really need to identify with imaging to prevent progression and rupture, which can be rather abrupt. So while this is in regards to isthmic lesions and otherwise healthy aortas, which we have the most data for, natural history of minimal aortic injury at other locations and in atherosclerotic aorta is less clear. Also less clear is the association and impact of distal showering of thrombi from minimal aortic defects, um, which are shown to go to the spleen and kidney circulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh... So Mariana, how about the management of these lesions? What are the current recommendations for the management of MAI? And as you answer, we'll show figure 12, which classifies the injuries according to the Society of Vascular Surgery, uh, or SVS, Vancouver, and the Harborview classification systems. Sure, Dr. Klein. As Dr. Kapoor has mentioned, the management and recommendations for the treatment of the MI lesions reflect growing knowledge of the lesions over the last decade or even longer. On the display table, our audience can see the different classifications and grading systems for the traumatic aortic injury. And the left one on the table uh, is presented by the Society of the Vascular Surgery uh, from 2009. And this is the classification which is most widely used. This specific classification does not uh, account or um, sort of uh, takes into consideration the size of the lesion, but instead it based on the depth of the aortic valve involvement. And it classifies minimal aortic injury only the intimal findings and classifies intramural hematoma is more as of moderate type of injury and consistent with the type two. Two other classifications, the Vancouver classification and the Harborview classification that defined in 2012 and 2016 respectively, they are more clinically and the outcome oriented. And therefore they have a better reproducibility and treatment precisions in comparison to the SVS classifications. In those two classifications, intramural hematoma that measure less than one centimeter is within the spectrum of the minimal aortic injury. Moreover, the authors that have been involved in the SVC classifications in 2009 subsequently have really additional papers from 2015 and later where they indeed also were uh, describing intramural hematoma that measure less than one centimeter rather as a minimal aortic injury given its favorable outcome. 
two other aortic injuries, specifically intimal flap, which would be larger than one centimeter, or small pseudo aortic, uh, I'm sorry, pseudo aneurysm that measures less than 1.5 centimeter, are currently being debated to be included in the spectrum of the minimal aortic injury, considering growing evidence of their favorable outcome with the non operative management. In regards to the management itself of the currently accepted minimal aortic traumatic lesions, uh, the non-operative approach consists of uninterrupted blood pressure and heart rate control with the agents such as beta blockers or the calcium channel blockers uh, with additional recommendation to include aspirin if there are no contraindications. Such a management has shown uh, that the progression of the lesion is significantly drops down from 12% to 2%. And uh, the follow-up imaging with multi-detector CT is the key component of the care just to select those patients, that small proportion of the patients that do fail the conservative management. Uh, in regards to this imaging follow-up, unfortunately, there is no unified recommendations in regards to the timing and the frequency of repeating imaging, but nevertheless, the vast majority of the institutions perform the follow-up multi-detector CT within the first week from the initial injury. At our institution, it's usually at 48 or 72 hours. If there are signs of the residual injury, then the subsequent imaging is usually performed at six and 12 months after the initial event. Terrific, thank you, Mariana. So let's finish by discussing the treatment of MAI from the surgical perspective. Let's have you detail the role of uh, TVAR in this particular setting, and we'll show figure 13 as you discuss this. Absolutely, Dr. Klein. Um, in general, it is very rare that the aortic intervention is deemed necessary for minimal aortic injury. The typical scenario where the intervention might be pursued includes the presence of minimal aortic injury and significant brain or spine injuries, where the optimization of the systemic blood pressure, which is required for the minimal aortic injury, would be catastrophic for the cerebral or spinal cord perfusion. For the surgical intervention, the open surgical approach has been almost entirely replaced by the TVAR, uh, for its uh, relatively uh, uh, low uh, complication profile. And the TVR stands for the thoracic and the vascular aortic repair with the stent. If an MI lesion progresses, then the TVR is usually performed in semi-elective cases. In some cases, persistence of thoracic symptoms despite stable MI lesion also leads to the use of the TVR as seen on the provided example. Our patient continued to have the chest pain beside, in, besides this, well, in, uh, despite the stability of the MI lesion. That has led to the TVR used and his symptoms have completely resolved post-procedure. Uh, in regards to the preparation for the TVR, the pre-TVR multi-detector CT and geography is used to guide the decision regarding the size of the stand and the complication rate uh, of the TVR is relatively low. Uh, for the literature, it's anywhere between 3 to 18 percent across the all blunt uh, traumatic injury cases. Terrific. Well, Drs. Kapoor and Zagoraskaya, I want to thank the both of you for taking the time today to discuss your paper on minimal aortic injury, mechanisms, imaging manifestations, natural history, and management, which can be found in the current November 2020 issue of Radiographics. Doctors, thank you very much for your article and for taking the time to discuss it with me today. Thank you, Dr. Klein, for the opportunity. Thank you very much for the honor to present our work to the journal audience.